Thanks for tuning in to the Illuminations Podcast. We love having you here. It is our mission to be a beacon of light on your journey towards conscious and mindful living. In our weekly episode, we bring you inspiring change makers in the field of spirituality, healing, personal growth, and wellness who share their insight and expertise so you can navigate your way to a happier, healthier, and more purposeful life. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Illuminations World Podcast. I'm your host, Nia Roy. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, yoga teacher, and sound therapist here at Illuminations. So we are back once again with another episode with another speaker. And for this one, we have a very special guest. Her name is Nancy Zabane. She is a Kundalini yoga teacher who's been teaching for over a decade now. And today our topic is all about how Kundalini yoga cultivates compassion and conscious living. I'm super excited for this one because... I know very, very little about Kundalini Yoga, but I've always been curious, so um, just here to learn. So let's get straight into it. But first of all, thank you so much for being part of today's show, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Nia. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> and I always feel inspired and excited to share about uh, the work that inspires me. Well, what can I, where can I begin? <laughs> Kundalini yoga. I mean, there are so many different approaches, different traditions. And uh, I think it's really important to begin with the fact that there are different approaches to sort of the whole premise of Kundalini. Yeah. But uh, the way that I approach it is that there is this notion this idea that there is this energy that lies almost dormant in all of us until it's awakened. Mm -hmm. And that throughout our lives, we have the opportunity to work with that energy of awakening, that energy of pure consciousness. And uh, the lineage that I have sort of, I suppose, been training in for many years is an amalgamation of different approaches from different traditions that include everyone from um, uh, everyone from Shivananda, Yogananda, uh, to Baba Siri Chand, uh, and uh, ultimately to Yogi Bhajan, who really popularized the teachings in North America. Mm. And uh, and and it's quite interesting because uh, really there is this fascination around this kundalini, this mystical uh, kundalini energy that uh, lies in the fourth vertebrae at the base of the spine. Fourth uh, vertebrae at the, at base, the base of the spine. And, uh, and, and there is this, this energy. So you can look at it from so many different perspectives. But from a psycho-spiritual point of view, it's interesting to really look at it as the fullest potential of your awakening in this lifetime. Right. So, so it's because like from, from what you're saying, it's this dormant energy that lies in the fourth vertebrae, the base of a spine. The whole purpose of our current life, or one of, I, if that's the case, is to awaken it. So what exactly does awakening mean? it mean because you hear that a lot like awakening your kundalini so what does that mean so to to bring it down to the most basic terms nia i i like to look at it as sort of serving your divine consciousness so i am that awakening uh, is about really serving the highest version of myself and and it's it's if you if you look at it in, in highly simplistic terms we all know when we're operating at 20 or 30 percent in our lives. Yeah. Between me and me, I know what, what my potential is. And then there is that part of me, uh, that, that, that best version, that better version of me, that knows that there's more there, that, there's knows, that knows that there's this greater depth, that there's deeper that I can go. And it's that... Um, it's that energy of awakening. It's that energy of consciousness that I'm referring to. It's almost like, you know, the best version of yourself, mm. the fullest potential of you. What is the fullest potential of Nia? 
Mm. You know, where can she go? What is her destiny? She's born with a mission, with a magnitude. How does she serve that? Is she conscious of that? And then what are the tools that she has to keep her awake? And this is where the yoga part comes in. Right. So yoga is the union, the yoke between the finite and the infinite. So going beyond the maya, the illusion of this earthly realm and into this infinite space of relating to ourselves as infinite beings, as spirit beings in a human form. That, um, and this human form comes to an end. You know, it, life is fragile. Um, and uh, everything has, and you know, everything in this life has an ending, but the spirit sort of continues and lives on. And what is that spirit? And how can I cultivate an awareness, a consciousness, a constant connection with that spirit? Right. And yoga, yoga is is a toolkit to keep us awake, to keep us sensitive, to keep our sensory awareness open. Mm -hmm. Uh, to all the possibilities. Right. So when it comes down to, when you say yoga and kundalini yo yoga specifically, it's very different to the, um, the, the asana practice that you, you see, whether it's hatha yoga, vinyasa and so on. So what makes it different and, and, and why is it, that it has a different approach than the traditional asana practice. So it combines essentially the Raj, uh, Shakti and Bhakti traditions of yoga. Okay. Which combine everything from the asana, so there is a strong asana practice, to uh, the Bhakti practice, which is much more focused, let's say, on the, on the mantra. Mm. And, and meditation is a huge, huge part of it. So no kundalini yoga experience as we teach it is complete without these elements mm -hmm. uh, combining everything from the dynamic movement and the asana to, uh, to the mantra, to the, to the mudra, to the conscious eye focus, to the pranayam, the breath work, mm -hmm. and, and the meditation. Meditation, really all yoga is meant to help to facilitate a deeper listening to help us to develop our capacity to witness so every good strong yoga practice should ideally have a strong meditation focus mm, absolutely yeah. so can you tell us a little bit about the impact of practicing kundalini yoga on your day-to-day -day life yes so really it's it's like it just, it keeps you on top. It keeps you on top of yourself. You know what, what I'm saying? What does that mean? It means it's like, okay, you have something happen to you. I don't know, someone cuts you off when you're driving your car or your husband says something and you receive it a certain way and the stick comes out. Mm. You know? <laughs> and you're really in that place of being triggered mm. and, um, and uh, you want to go into the victim. Yeah. Like, I blame you. You're responsible for this. I'm feeling that. Kundalini yoga on a day-to-day -day level is meant to really keep you on top of your stuff, mm. keep you on top of yourself so that you are constantly, constantly living in the awareness that you are 100% fully responsible and fully accountable for every single thing that happens in your life. And that is a radical way to live. Right. So it's highly confrontational. Mm -hmm. The idea is, oof, okay, well, I've got to catch myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into that place of blaming mm -hmm. or into that place of being the victim or to pander to the victim. I'm going to find out what that really is all about. And that means getting curious. Mm -hmm. That means owning my own story, owning the baggage that I bring into that moment and rising above the mediocrity of the mind. Remember that the mind is fast. It's faster than God. I love to use that mm -hmm. expression. Um, and once the mind intervenes and interferes, we, uh, we really cease to begin to appreciate that um, if we don't train the mind to serve our spirit, it will serve our instincts. Right. So, so 
when if you were sorry if you were to tell me like a structure that a kundalini yoga practice would have what would that look like and that's one question and i i'm also really curious to know about the energy work that happens because a lot of people at least from from what i've heard I've heard stories of people trying kundalini yoga and their lives changed or or they they've a completely different person but even for the worse you know so what is the structure of a kundalini practice and what how can that energy work shift you if it's in a positive way or a negative way so I teach and I train teachers through the Kundalini Research Institute and there is a format that we teach mm -hmm. and um, every Kundalini Yoga class begins with a tune-in. We tune in with certain mantras. Those mantras are influenced by certain traditions including the Sikh tradition. We then, uh, we then um, go into a pranayama and a warm-up uh, Subsequent to that, we continue with a Kriya. A Kriya is a dedicated set of movements and actions with a specific um, outcome. So it might be a Kriya for the nerves, a Kriya for sexuality, a Kriya to, um, to um, support our, our lymphatic system. I mean, mm. this is how they were designed and put together with that level of intelligence. We then go into a relaxation, which is usually anywhere between seven and 10 minutes, and then close with a meditation. And a meditation could involve anything from um, a point of focus with drisht, uh, with the eyes. It could involve um, a mantra, chanting of a mantra for 11 minutes. It could involve just sitting still, uh, working on the breath, working with um, a pranayama, but always a different point of focus. And no two Kundalini Yoga classes are alike. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the only thing that sort of never changes is the fact that we tune in and we tune out. Right. Um, but actually the structure, and, and there's a, there is a fundamental structure, but in terms of the Kriya, that, that could change. The warm-up could change. The mm -hmm. meditation could change. And that's interesting. It's interesting because it trains us to be with the unpredictable. It trains mm. us to really go beyond the sort of like, okay, if you if you sort of consider a lot of other practices, it's about moving into that rhythmic, yeah. repetitive um, hatha sort yeah. of focus. Yeah. Whereas in these teachings, we really train you to be uh, sort of with the unpredictable. And that might include everything from bouncing up and down to dancing to panting heavily like a lion to um, to having your arms in the air for three minutes at a time, it's just totally unpredictable. Every kriya is different, and 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 who and the teacher decides the kriya uh, based on his or her creativity, or is there a science behind that as well? So there is an intelligence, and in the way that we train teachers is really to tap into the frequency, to tap into the frequency of the group, into perhaps the theme of that class. I mean, if I'm teaching the elderly, it'll be different from mm. when I teach a group of women, teaching a group of women relative to teaching a group of children. So it's adapted according to that. Um, there is a lot of creativity that mm. comes from the teacher. However, we try not to sort of alter, alter certain fundamentals of the teachings. Um, all yoga is quite syncretic. Mm. Uh, and synthesized and there is the influence of the essence of the teacher um, so yes actually the the creativity of the teacher is not about them it's not about their ego it's about actually tuning into the creativity and frequency of the, of group, the class of yeah. the class of the higher intelligence so going beyond the ego of teacher channeling into something greater tapping into the golden chain and really, really feeling out what is needed, most needed in the moment. Usually a class is prepared ahead of time. Uh, so, you know, in the moment, not a lot can change. But, you you know, I've been in situations where I've changed the meditation, for example, or I've decided that this group needs more of a relaxation. Or, you know, there might be other things that I shift slightly just to adapt to 
um, whatever it is that is most needed yeah. in the moment. Got you. So when it comes to, let's say, uh, when you're in a meditation, right? And like you said, a lot can come up, right? How do you manage, let's say, if you're new to this practice and you perhaps you do this practice and um, a lot can come up and what if it's overwhelming to you? How do you manage with what's coming up? And is there any form of danger when it comes to, let's say, opening the Pandora's box and not knowing what to do with it? Sure, sure. Uh, that's an important question and, and it happens. I mean, the thing is, when we're working on ourselves at that deep level, anything can come up. Can come up. Anything can come up. So, and it can be highly confrontational. Yeah. Um, I have people come into my classes and they're elated, they're blissful, they have these super high energy levels when they leave. I have people who have experiences where all they feel is to cry. And, uh, and, and in both instances, I try to teach my students not to be attached to a particular outcome. I'm always surprised by what I find when I sit still, mm -hmm. by when I move a certain way, by when I breathe a certain way. Um, and it's astounding to me sometimes, you know, there might be wells of tears of release that I didn't know uh, needed to sort of happen. Um, so in terms of danger, I, I like to believe that, uh, that a good teacher, a solid teacher has the tools to really be able to guide someone in the in the right direction. Sometimes what is needed is is for that person to be pulled aside, you know, for, for, for us as teachers to get curious, mm -hmm. find out what's going on for that person. There might be something much, much deeper, and then we can make specific recommendations. And that what that person needs in that moment might need more might be more classes, mm -hmm. might be a dedicated meditation. Uh, they might be a great candidate for the teacher training mm. or what they might need is deeper support, psychotherapy. Um, it, it, the, the practice might have uncovered some unfinished business and that requires work. And this is where sort of the, the complementary work comes in. I'm a trained um, sort of I'm trained in a psychotherapeutic method uh, called compassionate inquiry. Mm. And it's highly, highly complementary. And I find that really it, it's, it's a tool that as a teacher has really supported me aside from the, the, the various teachings that I have been able to tap into simply through the teachings themselves. Um, I have my own guides, my own teachers um, who have supported me on my journey. So I know uh, how important it is to have a good, strong mentor, somebody who can guide you in the right direction. Sometimes it's a collection of people that can guide you. So really a good teacher a strong teacher um is 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 a human being recognizes themselves as a human being and opens up to the possibility that anything can happen in the space that they help to facilitate and hold and 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 really has the tools to expand beyond themselves and to tune into exactly what is needed in that moment make recommendations hold the space for that individual note what's coming up for them without attachment but also with a certain level of, of intelligence that allows them to uh, understand what is most needed. So how would you know that Kundalini yoga is for you or you need Kundalini yoga versus something else? How would you know? So I always tell people to just come and have an experience. And uh, it, it's always interesting for me to, to sort of witness like the journey uh, of certain people. I have people who are like, yes, I'm going to come to your class next week for sure, for sure. And then a year later, I haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, I see them and they'll say, yeah, 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 I want to get to a class. And, and, and my feeling is with that person, they're not ready. Mm -hmm. They're not ready to kind of have that journey or, or engage that experience um, because it can be quite confrontational to yeah. be still in that way, to move in that way, to transform energy in that way, to awaken aspects of yourself in that very deep way. Um, so I would, I would just say to people, you know, you're ready when you're ready. 
You know, you're, you're kind of like, if, if you're curious, go and have an experience. Don't be afraid. Go to somebody who has good, strong training. And I ask people over and over again to find out who your teachers are, to find out who their teachers are, mm -hmm. to find out who their teachers' teachers are. Not to overattach yourself, but to understand also um, if somebody is working through some kind of a lineage, mm -hmm. if there is a higher intelligence, if, uh, if there's a, a framework, a benchmark that you can refer to, and that it's not just some teacher uh, or individual projecting from their ego. And, you know, inevitably when that happens, there are other interests. So I'm very, very, very um, sort of, uh, what is the word? I, I, I just caution people in a place like Dubai to be mindful, to ask questions, to get <laughs> curious. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about your journey with kundalini yoga how were you like before and how has it impacted your life 10 years later yeah so uh so that's a big question i am i've been married now for 22 years uh i have three teenage children um so the the teachings came to me about uh, 13 years ago in actually my own garden and uh and it was a really incredible experience and i remember the first time i experienced the teachings asking myself like what is this this is power whatever this is it's powerful i feel incredible something's going on something's being shaken inside of me and um and at the t at that time in my life i was really moving out of the corporate space mm -hmm moving much more into the emotional intelligence space and I was open I was curious but I was I was also tired mm -hmm. I was a little bit burnt out from the corporate world um and uh, and I was sort of you know 12 years into my marriage or less actually I was eight nine years into my marriage and it was heavy it was kids it was marriage it was work it was trying to balance everything it was my nervous system feeling mm -hmm. like It was a little bit shot, to be honest. Um, so when I came into the technology of uh, Kundalini Yoga, I just found that over time, because I started practicing every week and then mm -hmm. twice a week, um, and I just began to feel really, really good, really strong. I mean, not just physically strong, but mentally strong and emotionally strong. And I found myself just getting stronger. So... Actually, uh, the deeper I went, the more I began to sort of feel differently about my life. Mm. And things became more clear. Um, I, I was less reactive in my life, much more responsive, mm. and even much more proactive. And I was able to make decisions in a much more conscious way. Mm. So, I mean, not only did I begin to feel sort of physically stronger uh, and emotionally stronger, But ultimately, it was a kind of spiritual strength that I was able to derive from regular practice and eventually, you know, sort of meeting more teachers and, 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 and some of the teachers that have had probably the greatest impact on, on my own teaching now and, my, uh, and on me as a human being, um, just to really learn to take full accountability mm -hmm. for my life. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that became the fuel um, to to make mindful decisions that have had great impact mm. actually it, it, it I decided to uh, found a platform called darshan we've now uh, it became sort of a training platform and we now hold trainings we hold retreats um, we hold regular classes our community of teachers are out there in the community holding regular classes in different spaces. We've trained over a hundred teachers now in, uh, in, in this particular body of teachings in the region. It's taken me to places like Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine. You know, it, this was one of the first yoga teacher trainings in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So imagine from a, you know, from a socio-political point of view how important that is. So lots of, lots of just jewels opened up to me. Uh, and the transformation came in just more sensitivity in my relationship mm -hmm. with my husband, more openness 
and tolerance and patience in my relationship with my children and just a greater ability to really um, see where I can best serve and, and build up a, a trajectory towards that. So it's more, uh, it's just, yeah, just feeling more solid, more responsive, more proactive, more responsible uh, for uh, the state of my life. And actually, uh, I serve through that grace and that clarity. I love that. Yeah. That sounds amazing. So before we end the show, are there any tips that you can share with our listeners, um, perhaps how they can get started or maybe something that they can take away for their day-to-day -day lives? Definitely. Um, I, I say to everybody, it doesn't have to be a 90-minute class every day or even you know twice a week or even once a week. But having a regular, consistent practice of even three minutes a day can make a massive difference in your life. Mm. And that includes... Um, just having like three minutes. Do you have three minutes? Why three minutes? Because in three minutes, the blood uh, chemistry begins to change. Mm. And if you can just dedicate three minutes to your meditation every day, that can be more powerful than just going to a weekly yoga class. Uh, and to really recognize the consistency, commitment, and sacrifice, but, mm. but sacrifice not with that sort of heavy negative connotation that we associate it with, but sacrifice as in I'm offering, I'm going to offer up my three minutes now for my divinity, gotcha. for the best version of me. And I'm going to do it in that special corner in my house um, and, and put whatever I need to on my altar and just bow to that, bow to that divinity, bow to that higher consciousness. So that's like cultivating that compassion within exactly. you as well. Exactly. So one last question before we end the show. Um, why white? Why white? So that's a beautiful question and an interesting question. It's not mandatory to wear white at all. Um, but that's what you see. Yeah, right? that's everyone you, wearing white. Yeah, and 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 the turban and the, and the turban. turban. So, so two things. One is that white projects. White um, projects all the colors. Mm. And um, and I mean, if you think about the contrast, black absorbs. Mm. So you want to have a technology that supports you in projecting the energies. Yeah. So so it's about really bringing an interior. A, a, an interior influence to to your space mm. that's number one number two uh cotton is really really important we see people practicing yoga all the time wearing it's spandex and tight things and it's like your your skin is not breathing yeah. let yourself sweat wear things breathable fabrics yeah. that's really really important so those are two two points about the white and the cotton the the uh, turban is interesting because we know that we contain the temples at the crown and this can help us actually in our ability to go deeper into a meditative space the mind needs all the help it can get wow so <laughs> and that, so, so that really helps it can help it's like the difference between putting your hair up in a bun and putting your hair down i mean you feel different when your hair is down so if you tie your hair up in a rishi knot and and even just uh, experiment with containing the temples in that way. See if it changes your experience of oh. the meditation. See if it changes your ability to focus and concentrate. Some people might not actually experience a huge shift or a difference. And you know what? They don't need to wear. I mean, nobody is telling you to wear anything, to do anything. But I personally have noticed a difference. I feel the difference if my hair is down. I feel the difference if it's up. I feel the difference if I'm leading a class space and wearing dark colors, which I haven't done probably in years, uh, versus uh, leading a class wearing bright colors that allow me to project. Also not overexposing the body mm. because, yeah, all of this, you know, we want to give the student an experience of the highest version of themselves. We don't want them to be distracted by, oh, look at what she's wearing. Look at that lovely spandex outfit. Look at how lovely her figure is. No. You know, you're looking, you're projecting, you're taking, um, you're taking the instruction from the teacher, but you're not diverted by the teacher. Teacher is just a messenger in that moment. She's just a challenge, a channel, mm. and uh, 
yeah, anything that helps the student and helps you to really hold that space, uh, that elevated space. I love that. Thank you so much, Nancy, for uh, sharing so much insight and for being with me here today. And we look forward to having you back perhaps another time. And thank you to all the listeners for tuning in once again. Until next time, stay safe and live life. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love to have you tune in again next week as we discuss more engaging topics on relationships, health, career, self-care, and spirituality. If you'd like to help support this podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave us a rating and review. We'd be extremely grateful. To catch all the latest from us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Illuminations World or visit the Illuminations World YouTube channel for more inspiring content. See you again next week and until then, live light.